CTO and co-founder of Cider Security. Now, a lot of people have asked us, what kind of a, what kind of a name is Cider for a security company? So we do CICD, security. We do cyber. It's a catchy five-letter word. And we also like cider. So hence the name cider. Now, what does CICD security actually mean? Well, in today's reality, as you guys know, the engineering train is moving faster and faster as time goes by, with release times becoming shorter and shorter, deployments being done on a daily or an hourly or a minutely basis, depending on the organization, with a larger variety in the technical stack and the languages that we use for development, with the adoption of new technologies becoming faster and faster from the moment an engineer reads about a new language or framework in a blog or hears about it in some dev conference to the moment that framework is actually in production, could be a matter of minutes. Infrastructure as code has changed the ecosystem in a way that not only applications are codified, but entire data centers are managed with configuration files that are stored inside our source control systems. And then a lot of manual processes are deprecated in favor for more automations that put together our continuous integration and continuous delivery processes. Now, how well is security adapting to these changes and to this velocity? Well, it's safe to say that today, security is struggling to keep up with the speed and the velocity of the engineering train. And that's especially relevant in today's day and age now that security is no longer a blocker. Security doesn't have the privilege it used to have where everything was uh, needed to be explicitly approved by security before going to production. Organizations aren't willing to slow down the pace of engineering anymore for the sake of security. And then security has to find a way to keep up with engineering. So when we look at the engineering ecosystem and the building blocks that comprise it, we have a combination of different systems and different processes and objects that ultimately end up being moved from an engineer's workstation all the way to production with a combination of human collaborators and applications and services that connect to the different systems. And of course, a lot of third parties and access tokens and programmatic credentials that are spread around uh, all over the environment. Now, the, the challenge with, with dealing with these environments is that usually the typical environment doesn't look like the slide we saw earlier. It looks a little bit more like this. Definitely in, in, in big organizations, but even in small startups like CIDR, you have a big variety of, of systems and, and a fusion of a lot of human collaborators and applications. And every one of these objects is potentially connected to one or more of the other objects. So it's a lot of chaos and it's a big engineering jungle out there. And the complexity for us as security that are trying to defend these environments is that we have to become very intimately familiar with the inner workings, what's going on in the engineering environment under the hood in order to be able to really understand what are the risks and what are the security measures and controls that we need to implement. We need to be familiar with the systems that comprise the engineering ecosystem. We need to understand what languages we have in our source control, what repos, and then we need to be familiar, familiar with the pipelines that we have in our CI and CD systems and which secrets we have in those systems which secrets are scoped to specific pipelines, and then which secrets are uh, scoped globally and accessible by any pipeline, then we need to understand how pipelines and which pipelines connect to source control to actually build the code, and how do they do that, with what permission, with what level of access. And ultimately, we need to understand how and which pipelines end up taking code, building it, packaging it, uploading it to the relevant artifact repositories, then uploading it to the container registries as containers, and ultimately, which pipelines, which credentials, and which permissions are then used to take a container and upload it to production. Once we have this mapping, we also need to, of course, understand which humans and which applications are able to access each part of this ecosystem, how are they accessing it, what level of permission. And unless we have that level of intimate knowledge of the environment, it's very hard for us to derive the risk. 
It's very hard for us to make smart decisions on what controls we want to implement in our engineering ecosystem. Now, mapping the environment is, is, is not a trivial task given how fast-paced and dynamic the ecosystem is. And, and I can tell you from personal experience that for security, trying to understand what's going on and maneuver through the engineering environment feels sometimes a bit like walking through New York with a map of Tokyo in the sense that it's very easy to get lost, it's very easy to have partial visibility of what's going on, and we don't really know who to refer to if we have specific questions around specific systems or specific gaps that we identify. In parallel, what's going on is that it's become very evident that attackers and the most sophisticated hackers out there are focusing more and more on targeting engineering environments, uh, this year specifically was a year that proved that all types of hackers of all levels of sophistication uh, are focused on engineering environments. I talked about this a little bit in yesterday's opening words, if anyone was here. Uh, but some examples of high magnitude attacks that happened just this year that proved that hackers are focusing on engineering environments were the SolarWinds hack at the beginning of the year, where SolarWinds had their CI system hacked, and then used to spread malware to 18,000 of their clients. Or Kotkov, which were breached. And then organizations using Kotkov as part of their CI had their secrets stored as environment variables exfiltrated to the attacker's cloud. Or PHP, that had their Git infrastructure hacked, and then for a while, PHP itself, anyone using the latest version of PHP, was downloading a version of PHP bundled with malware. Dependency confusion, which many DevOps engineers dealt with uh, for a long while when it was published, uh, where giants like Microsoft, Apple, but many, many others were at the risk of having their developer endpoints and their CI systems compromised as a, as a result of the insecure way they were managing dependencies in third-party libraries. And then just recently, the latest NPM incidents where the COA, the RC, the UA parser packages, some of the most common JavaScript packages in NPM were hacked and infected with malware, again, putting millions of developer endpoints and CI environments at risk of being compromised. So it's very clear that a single bad step in the CI or a single place, a single line of code where a dependency is imported in an insecure manner can have de devastating results given the, the wiring of the CI CD environment. And so it's not only about security trying to bridge the gap towards engineers. It's also engineers that are trying to better understand what mistakes they're look, they're, they can avoid and what measures they need to take in order to prevent their workstation or their CI environment from being compromised. So that's today's attack surface. Uh, and, and CI CD security is about allowing that engineering train to continue to move fast and to continue to move faster and faster, but without making any compromises on security. That's what we believe the essence of CI-CD security is. And we at CIDR have devised and defined three disciplines which, when put together, comprise uh, uh, what organizations need to do in order to build an effective CI-CD security program. The measures are in front of you. They're called SIP, SOP, and SAP. Security in the pipeline, security of the pipeline, and security around the pipeline. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is talk to you about what SIP, SOP, and SAP are and how organizations should be thinking about them. We have to keep in mind before we dive into SIP, SOP, and SAP that building effective security, uh, CICD security programs is reliant upon establishing that what we call the technical DNA, that deep and intimate understanding of all the flow all the way from code to deployment and the way the systems interact with each other, just like we saw in the slide earlier. And then once we establish that, that would be kind of the base layer on top of which we build the SIP, SOP, and SAP. So let's begin with SIP, security in the pipeline. So security in the pipeline deals with uh, addressing the risk of code that has insecure, uh, uh, insecure code, code with security flaws or security misconfigurations. And then SIP is about finding the most effective measures that are tailored to the organization stack to then detect the flaws and the issues in the code. So what do we need to do in order to be good at SIP? We need to first map 
what systems store our code across the entire ecosystem, what languages and frameworks we use within each and every one of those repos. We have to do that on a continuous basis since, again, the ecosystem is constantly changing and evolving. And then in parallel, we, what we have to do is map what are the different types of solutions that are relevant to the technologies that we're using for development in being able to find those security flaws and those security misconfigurations in a manner that's most effective for the language in question. So I just have a few example open source uh, scanners, but obviously there are numerous dozens of, of these scanners, a combination of open source and commercial scanners out there. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the logos or maybe even use them in your organization. And once we have that knowledge of what are the relevant scanners out there, what we have to do is pair the repos and the scanners. Pair each scanner to that context where it's most relevant in uh, and be able to do that, of course, in the most effective manner without taking too much of DevOps time. So we have to weave them in in an effective manner. And then we have to think about the fact that each one of these scanners has its own format, its own way of generating output. They're not compliant with each other in relation to how they generate output. But of course, we don't want to watch or, or examine the results in different panes of glass. We need to build a unified pane of glass for being able to view the results across all our development contexts, in all of our repos, across all of our NCMs. Once we have that pane of glass, and once we look at the results uh, in, in one sing, single centralized location, we're then able to shift the results left or to whichever destination we want in the organization. So that's SIP. The next pillar is SOP, security of the pipeline. Now, security of the pipeline deals with the security posture and the security settings of the different systems we have in our pipeline, the source control, the CI, the artifact repository, the container registry. And it's coming from the notion that I mentioned earlier that attackers are looking to target those systems more and more. And even the most sophisticated hackers out there are looking to get to CI, to SCM, to developer workstations. Uh, and we need to make sure that the posture of our systems and processes is appropriate to the system, to systems that are targeted by the most advanced attackers. And the best way to uh, explain how we think about SOAP is, about, is looking at it from the adversary perspective. So obviously adversaries are looking to get to the crown jewels. That's where the sensitive data is. That's where the mission critical tasks are running. The crown jewels are production environments. And then traditionally, there were three primary ways for attackers to get to production. They were either breaching the perimeter with an SSH port that's open, or a SQL injection or remote command execution vulnerability in an application in the perimeter, or by abusing misconfigurations in AWS or Azure or GCP or whatever compute platform uh, is being used, or simply by running malware in an endpoint that has access to production. Now, each one of these vectors has a wide category of very mature solutions that are aimed at detecting and uh, preventing and responding to these types of vectors. For the perimeter, we have the web application firewall, we have the IPS, we have the periodical pen tests. For the cloud, we have the CSPMs. And then for the workstations and endpoints, we of course have the antivirus solutions, the EDRs, the endpoint protection solutions. But then as we discussed, there's a whole new flavor of vectors of getting to production through that red carpet that is paved to production from the engineering environment. So that vector is about abusing the native deployment flows and systems in order to get to production. And SOAP is about having the equivalent of the solutions in blue for the vector of getting to production by abusing software delivery and um, software delivery processes. The last pillar is SAP, security around the pipeline. Now let's, let's remember what we talked about. If we have a production environment with a pipeline that has code and artifacts flowing all the way through it from a developer's workstation to production, we of course have the SOP, security of the pipeline, which is the layer that protects the pipeline, the systems, the processes themselves. We have SIP, which is about finding flaws and misconfigurations in the code that we're shipping through the pipeline. But then both of them together, even if we're perfect at them, don't mean a lot if someone can connect directly to Kubernetes 
and ship a malicious container to production, or connect directly to AWS and modify a piece of Lambda code in a manner that's not consistent or compliant with whatever we have in source control. So SAP is about taking all the effective measures to make sure that the pipeline isn't bypassed. And if we want to do SAP effectively, we want to answer two main questions. One, is everything in production originating from the pipeline? Two, are we using all the effective controls and measures to make sure that no single human or application is able to directly push code down the pipeline without the effective, uh, without the, um, the relevant reviews and approvals and measures like protected branch settings or like many other setting settings across the different systems that help us make sure that, again, the pipeline cannot be bypassed. So we talked about having the comprehensive mapping, the technical DNA. We talked about SIP, SOP, and SAP that together comprise what we believe organizations need to be thinking about in the context of building effective, um, effective CI-CD security programs. Now a few takeaways. First of all, for defenders, AppSec is, um, for a long while now, not just about implementing code scanners. The risk is different, the attack surface is different, and we need to extend the scope of AppSec beyond implementing a code scanner here and there. To address the challenges and the risks and the complexities that we mentioned earlier, we need to be thinking simultaneously about SIP, SOP, and SAP. For engineers, you have to be patient with your AppSec and security teams. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of catching up to do. Uh, and, and of course, your collaboration and, uh, and assistance is required. And, uh, and if, our, if there are any hackers out there in the audience, uh, the takeaway is that I think you've done your fair share of damage for 2021, and uh, you're welcome to rest. Uh, that's it, thank you very much.